Again, that's uh, Oliver Rowland, uh, part of what is now being considered and not just a challenger to, to Formula One, to F1, but perhaps the leader. In talking with our very own James Hinchcliffe uh, not that long ago, it, it, it seemed uh, almost surreal in the state of, of motor car racing that we talk about this with electric cars. And, you know, it, it, with technology, every week that goes by, it seems less and less that fantastical. It seems less science fiction and more just science, quite honestly. And uh, now we're joined by Oliver Rowland. Good morning, Oliver. How are you doing today, buddy? Good morning. Good, thank you. How are you? Oh, being a, an English lad, or do I say Oli? I mean, uh, what do you go yeah, by? Uh, hey, Oli's fine, yeah. Oli, yeah. Oli, great to have you, my friend. Uh, this is astounding stuff. Now, for those that, you know, are, are casual race fans, let's say, and they, they, you know, over here in North America, where, you know, you're going to have a lot of NASCAR over here, but then there's, you know, the open uh, wheel racing and, and, and things like Formula One, yet it seems like on a weekly basis, Formula E is not just challenging F1. There are a lot of writers out there, a lot of, a lot of people who feel like it's actually taking over. So at some point, you must feel, uh, Ollie, that you've, you've made the right decision in what you've wanted to do with your life. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think certainly Formula E has had its challenges over the years, but um, I think if you look at it as a global championship and, and a spectacle, the, the races are very, very interesting to watch. Um, you know, the technology is constantly developing. Uh, there's new things and, and, you know, we're pushing things onto the road that are very relevant. Um, I think I do think it's super exciting and, and the fact that, you know, it has the potential to to overtake Formula One, I think is very realistic. Obviously, Formula One is in a very a big boom at the moment with Netflix and, and things going on in the US. But um, I think, you know, uh, most people that tune in and watch our championship and, and join with an open mind um, see that we have a, a pretty interesting show going on right now. Well, the, the, the even the venues, you know, like a lot of times F1, as you mentioned, has a lot of cachet. We know a lot of the names. It's certainly very famous, but the venues you know, have always been pretty exciting, pretty sexy. Well, I'm looking at, you know, you got Cape Town, Sao Paulo, Berlin. I mean, you're not, you're not racing in, you know, uh, you know, s smaller cities or towns where it doesn't really carry the same weight. These are our big time, massive events that Formula E is, you know, I think got it right. If I can say it that way, you know, if, if you want to have something that's competitive and seen as world big league, I think they've done that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the interesting thing for me when I was racing in Formula 3, Formula 2, all that sort of stuff, you know, you go to these circuits and quite often a big racetrack is kind of a bit in the middle of nowhere, you know, and, and you quite often see only your hotel, you know, and then the the racetrack and obviously the fans when they come on race day. But um, Formula E is very unique that we are in the city centre, you know, we are in the, the lively part of all these places as well. You know, we visit some mega places, but not only do we visit them, we race in them. So I think, um, yeah, certainly from a driver's perspective, it's, it's mega. You know, you can go for dinner wherever you want in the evenings and and just enjoy the real, the, the atmosphere of the city as well as obviously racing in it as well. So, so Ollie, the, the people are probably listening and who will see this uh, later today. Um, the progression for you was what? As a kid, what was the attraction? A lot of times it's, it's go-karts or um, I know uh, certain motorcycles and motorcycle racing is huge in Europe. Um, what was it as a kid that said to you, okay, I got to go fast here. I got to get, I got to get on something that goes fast. What was it for, for Oliver Rowland? Yeah, I think it was very young for me. I mean, my, my parents had uh, motorbikes, so they were in the garage. Yeah. I used to sit on it, rev it up, think it was amazing. And they used to watch quite a lot of um, videos and, and and TV when it was on of the Isle of Man TT, the, the bike racing. So so for me, it really started as more of a passion for, for bikes. Um, and, and my dad was pr pretty into bikes as well. And he got me a quad when I was two. Um, so I, he would follow me around with like a little kill switch on the, on the, the rope behind. Um, so I did that. And by the time I was four, I could kind of ride around on two wheels. Um, and I'd kind of outgrown this little 50 CC quad. Um, and he wanted to get me a motocross bike. And at that point, my mum said, no, um, you know, it's too dangerous. Um, but she made the compromise that I could have a go-kart. So we took up the, the hobby of go-karting, um, we, we loved it. It was, it was a family thing that we did every weekend and uh, turned out I was pretty okay at it too. 
Um, and then, yeah, the, the journey is kind of long and difficult. We, I came from a background which really had, you know, we had nothing um, to, to go karting in the very beginning. We had no carpets, no no flooring. We couldn't afford to maintain the house. Credit card bills were getting higher and higher. And uh, we just used to, we did the best with what we had. And, I, and then I was lucky to be picked up by McLaren um, and the Racing Steps Foundation, who then funded me all the way to Formula 2. Um, was Had a few options in Formula 1 that didn't quite materialize after that. And uh, ended up in Formula E, but uh, yeah, it's been a pretty tough journey to get to here. When you think of how many kids try and how many kids make it as a professional, but uh, one that I certainly would do again. Well, that's a that's a remarkable story, uh, Ollie. Only because I think people see things like Formula One, race car, you know, uh, lifestyle, the champagne, the supermodels, you know, these kinds of things. Oh, there's Mick Jagger. We're pals. Like whatever, whatever that thing is, we just assume that somehow this has come very easily for these guys and for, for people like yourselves to live this superstar kind of lifestyle. But rarely do we ever think about the nuts and bolts of really what it takes to kind of get to these sort of levels. And a lot of it is just that sponsorship and to get a ride. I mean, it, th that for anybody is very difficult, let alone when a family has to really struggle I mean, and keep it together. I mean, I imagine in those early days for your parents, I mean, it's pretty scary stuff. I mean, you're 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 trying to find every penny you can in hopes that you can land something. So I imagine when McLaren comes around, the relief for you and for your family must have been uh, godlike, probably yeah. uh, when this happens. It was, yeah, because uh, I mean, obviously, I was aware that things were a struggle, but they they didn't used to try and put too much pressure on me when I was younger. But I remember the day very well that I came back from school and uh, Ron Dennis had left a voicemail on uh, our house phone. Back in uh, gone. Not everybody had, well, we had mobile phones, but house phones was more of a thing then. You know, he'd said, you know, I've been watching, I've seen what you do. I really like, you know, what you've done. And and the, I just remember the, the buzz and had like a, the tingling sensation in your head that you, you know, this is not real. And uh, yeah, I think for, for my entire family, it was a, it was a huge relief and, and just to the extent even then traveling, you know, we had to s support our own travel budget, which even is difficult when you're racing all around the world, you know, is uh, is quite hard. And I was quite unfortunate. I lost my dad when when I was 18. So I was in a very critical phase of my career. And uh, I only found out a couple of years ago that my mum was still paying off the, the credit card from him that... Uh, that he was uh, he was funding our racing from, and obviously uh, she she'd kept that for me for all that time for, for nearly ten years, and I was able to uh, obviously relieve her of that stress and pay it off once I knew. That is uh, that is a very heavy story that we're talking with Oliver Rowland, uh, Mahindra Racing for Formula E, uh, and you know that's very dr dramatic stuff. Uh, you know, well, hey, you just talk about Netflix. I hope they're watching this because uh, come <laughs> yeah, on. But like like he said i think a lot of a lot of people think that we it's an easy ride to the top and and for some it is you know there's there's some you know very very wealthy people that don't have to to go to these extents but um there is also the stories of the guys who uh and then there's guys in f1 you know that went through similar struggles had to had to make ends meet and do anything they could to make it to the top and uh, that was a, that's a, it's a family commitment as well that not a lot of people probably even see from outside of outside of motorsport no, I I don't think they would. Uh, the other thing, you know, in talking about what you do for a living and 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 uh, motor car sports as as a rule, if we're if we're talking about F one, the fan base and the loyalty to it is 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 generational. I mean, I I'm surrounded by Italian friends all the time. Uh, they want to talk about Ferrari like every five minutes. If it's not if it's not footy, it's it's Ferrari because at least Ferrari they are, they're all on the same team. When they start talking about Serie A and soccer, they all they do is fight with each other, which is you know if they're Italians, that's what they do well. So when it comes to, uh, you know, what they want, they, like they'll get like a, a part of a steering wheel or like a fuel pump for their birthday or something like weird stuff. You know, it's, if it comes from Ferrari, it's like God made it himself. And I think it's really interesting that um, in talking uh, with James about how Formula E has tried to vary itself in the modern version of what fans would want to do interaction, including likes. He was talking about, you know, uh, where, where the fans in Formula E can, can click on likes for their favorite driver and so on. Are you feeling that 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 fan base, that loyalty with Formula E building and getting bigger? Like when you go to these different venues, when when you show up in different places, can you feel the build of the fan base? 
Yeah, so I think interestingly, when I first joined Formerly, I think it's social media following and and things like that was actually pretty big. It was at a time when I think Formula One were not as keen on that side, and and Formerly really set a benchmark in terms of social media, and and I think COVID was tough for us, um, you know, because we were on an upwards trajectory, it, you know when you're established it's a bit easier but we kind of hit a, a, a rock in the road I think um, but this year has been uh, we've been to some mega locations everywhere we go is packed out from a crowd perspective um, so I think on that side it's been the events have been mega again and and the best that they've been um, I think social media is a little bit more difficult it's a bit up and down um, people I think choose and pick a little bit more and take less notice of some things so I, I've seen a maybe a slight drop on that side but um, in terms of the events themselves and and what we're bringing as a show I think it's uh, it's pretty cool and 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 not only that I mean from a racing driver's perspective like the level of the guys in in our championship is is extremely high you know you can't afford to leave a tenth not on the table and and lose seven eight positions on the grid you know it's uh it's um it's a pretty interesting championship from that perspective, which is why it makes it so interesting for for someone like like me. Well, I I do want to mention to the folks here that the next race is going to be Monaco. Uh, yes, that Monaco. Uh, that is airing this Saturday, so May the sixth at seven thirty a.m. on TSN. So once again, early morning uh, race, uh, uh, you know, action for for those in this country, which has a massive audience. As I said, it's a as a huge audience. So this is a pretty exciting and and Monaco, which uh, is uh, I went there once. Like if you really want to feel poor, just go to Monaco. I mean, I, I felt like I was walking with the with people with chickens and you know chasing around uh, you know pigs. Like I, you think you know what rich is until you go to Monaco. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, best of luck in that race. Um, you know, it's it's great to to talk to someone like yourself because they said you know. Uh, you've you you're you're young enough where you still have you know a lot of dreams and aspirations and I know certainly that uh, 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 Formula E is relying heavily probably on on its drivers and the personalities of its drivers because it really is at the heart of why people want to follow and I think you know in meeting you here today hearing your story I mean it's it's uh, it's almost overwhelming I mean I think you've won a lot of <laughs> certainly a fan in me but a lot of fans in in what you do and boy I'll I'll tell you I, I wish you all the luck in. Uh, we're uh, we're rolling people now in this household, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll wish you all the back. Uh, you know, look, we get a chance to talk to you again sometime. We'd love to do it, but Ollie, that was just wonderful here this morning. Absolutely, thank you very much. That is Oliver Roland uh, joining us here this morning as we talk Formula E once again. That race uh, on TSN uh, coming up this Saturday morning. That's seven thirty in Monaco, and once again, it is uh, it is a crazy and fast moving world in which you know whatever seemed impossible like two years ago, two years ago, folks, isn't, isn't that long ago, but what they're doing now and probably what they're going to do next year is going to change yet again. It evolves so quickly. And uh, that was just a great talk here this morning. It is coming up on 725. Once again, we're going to talk to uh, Rob Furnish from the Talking Buds podcast. Then we're going to talk to Italians. That's right. More Italians. I'm saying it that way because it's irritating. Like when you say Toronto with a second T, you see what I'm doing here? And I also found out Luch and Pat, they're going to join us uh, <laughs> tomorrow on Wednesday. Why don't we just become Tele Latino? <laughs> uh, that was great stuff there this morning with uh, Ollie. What a, you know, you just, you never really think about what it takes to get there. You know, when people start talking about not having carpets or flooring, and then they've got to, they've got to, as, as they would say in the business, then they got to find a ride. And he did. And you get a phone call, as he said, that what a great moment from McLaren on, on your answering machine. Uh, and I know sometimes that doesn't really translate maybe to even the audience that we're talking to right now. Uh, certainly, for, uh, it's an education even for myself when it comes to that. that uh, but I think that's like being, uh, I, I, you know, tight money-wise and on your answering machine, it's like, I don't know, Wayne Gretzky. I'm trying to think what the equivalent would be. Glenn say their phones. You're, would you would you want to play for the Oilers <laughs> in the day? Like I I just I I it, marvelous stuff here. Really, that was that, that was great.